Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by Gunsmoke, that famous Western series that was on the air for over 20 years. That's a long time. Yes, it is. Like Matt Dillon once said, I'm caught between a shootout and a sawmill. What does that mean? I'm not sure. Now, Sheriff, just one more question and my interview will be finished. Okay, that paper of yours certainly wants to know everything. Uh, what one thing in particular do you think is responsible for your excellent record in solving crimes? Observation. Keen observation. Uh huh. You can pick up a wealth of information from hearing and remembering seemingly unimportant things. I remember one time... Excuse me. Sure. Sheriff Crowley speaking. Yeah? Suicide? Ada Bell Fredericks? I'll be there in five minutes. I'm right with you, Sheriff. This is more than the paper bargained for. Uh, Shouldn't there be powder burns around the wound, Sheriff, if this is suicide? Should be. That's why this is no suicide. It's murder. Murder? That's right. And I'd like to know where you two fit into the picture. I thought Miss Ada had always lived alone. Well, I'm Mabel Foster, the old dame's niece. She asked me to come live with her three weeks ago as sort of a companion, I guess you'd call it. Aunt Ada had very strange tastes in her choice of companions. I'm just as good as you are, you money-grabbing Beethoven. Break it up, break it up. Where do you fit in? I'm Paul Westcott, a nephew. I came here three days ago to discuss some business arrangements at Aunt Ada's suggestion. What business arrangements? She was changing her will. Yeah. Now I gotta share half and half with this chiseler. I'm afraid you won't be sharing in any of it now, cousin. Murderers don't inherit. Say, what are you insinuating? I was in the kitchen putting nail polish on my fingers when I heard the shot. You have a nice manicure job there, Miss Foster. You know, I always smear mine, having the patience to wait five minutes for them to dry, I guess. Who's this female character? A reporter. Go on. Well, I was just finishing my left hand when Paul left. Where'd you go? I went out the side door to the garage, and I couldn't have shot Aunt Ada from the garage. But I didn't kill her either. I didn't have any reason. Seems to me you had plenty of reason, Miss Foster. Both of you. Cousin Mabel probably wouldn't wait for me to leave. She was just fooling around with her nails waiting. I wasn't out of the house more than three minutes when I heard the shot. Mabel probably ran in the bedroom, got Aunt Ada's gun from the dresser drawer, and shot her. Now I know who murdered old Ada Fredericks, and it wasn't Mabel. It was you, Paul Westcott. Do you know how the sheriff trapped Paul, even though he claimed to be in the garage at the time of the shooting? Well, in just one moment, we'll hear, but first... Well, I guess that observation is the key to this one. The sheriff said so himself. I don't mean to call you a dingbat. Well, I guess I do, but the key is nail polish. Okay, now who is the dingbat? Nail polish? PG, you have lost it this time. Really? Think about this. How can one fire a gun without smearing their polish? I don't know. I've never tried it. We see, but we do not do. And now, back to our mystery. You had to be the killer, Paul. Instead of going to the garage, you opened and slammed the door to make Mabel believe you'd gone. Then you tiptoed back into the room and shot your aunt. Mabel couldn't have fired the shot because, as the reporter here said, Mabel's fingers have an unusually nice polish job. 
Any married man would know that a woman sits around for at least five minutes waving her hands in the air so her polish will dry. But you admitted seeing her put the polish on less than three minutes before the shot was fired. Mabel couldn't have grabbed the gun out of the dresser and fired it. If she had, her polish would be smeared. Well, that's what I'd call having an alibi at the tip of your fingers. Dang, BG, you really pulled that one out of your... Don't say it. Okay, but you really did. Nail polish has saved the day. Justice has been done. Bit dramatic, aren't we? Probably. But I thought we needed something after that sorry excuse for a mystery. There is that. What's that you say? Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today, we're going to do the Western thing. I would love to do a good Western. Then you shall have your wish. Our featured story comes from the pen of John Meston and the tales of Gunsmoke. A man is hanged, but manages to survive. The rest is, well, amazing. I would expect nothing less from humanity. Oh yeah, I hear you. We also have one of my favorite stories. It comes from an anonymous emailer and tells a ghost story right out of the pages of the Old West. Yee-haw! My thoughts exactly. So let's stop this jabbering and get to this bit about the Texas Rangers. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle. Whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to? The Texas Rangers... A Century of Frontier Defense by Walter Prescott Webb. This book was written in 1935. It is somewhat grayed by the prejudice of the time. However, to pass it up for that reason would be to do yourself a disfavor. This book has more Texas history than anything I've read. And while most of that history centers around the Rangers, that does nothing to prevent us from gaining a perspective on Texas you've probably never seen before. Here's a clip from early in the book. In 1835, the Texas Rangers were organized and given legal status while Texas was in the midst of revolution against Mexico. Their almost continuous service to 1935, when they were absorbed in a larger organization, indicates that the need for them has been persistent, while their changing functions reflect the evolution of the society they protected from its primitive beginning as a frontier community to a commonwealth of five million people. Though his duties have varied from decade to decade, the ranger has been throughout essentially a fighting man. It was Eugene Manlove Rhodes who suggested that the Western man he was speaking of the cowboy, can be understood only when studied in relation to his work. And so it is with the ranger. When we see him at his daily task of maintaining law, restoring order, and promoting peace, even though his methods be vigorous, we see him in his proper setting, a man standing alone between a society and its enemies, when we remember that it was his duty to deal with the criminal in the dangerous nexus between the crime and the capture, when the criminal was in his most desperate mood, we must realize that neither the rules nor the weapons were of the ranger's choosing. It has been his duty to meet the outlaw breed of three races, the Indian warrior, Mexican bandit, and American desperado on the enemy's ground, 
and deliver each safely within the jail door or the cemetery gate. It is here recorded that he has sent many patrons to both places. As strange as it may seem in some quarters, the Texas Ranger has been, throughout the century, a human being, and never a mere automaton animating a pair of swaggering boots, a big hat, and a six-shooter, all moving across the prairies under a cloud of pistol smoke. Surely enough has been written about men who swagger, fan hammers, and make hip shots. No Texas Ranger ever fanned a hammer when he was serious, or made a hip shot if he had time to catch a sight. The real ranger has been a very quiet, deliberate, gentle person who could gaze calmly into the eye of a murderer, divine his thoughts, and anticipate his action. A man who could ride straight up to death. In Fatal Encounter, the last resort of a good officer, the ranger has had the unhurried courage to take the extra fraction of a second essential to accuracy, which was at a premium in the art and the science of Western pistology. The smoke from such a man's hand was a vagrant wisp, and never the clouds read of in books written for those who love to smell powder smoke vicariously. The method of telling the story of the rangers at work has the added merit of revealing the relative nature of the workman. From the records emerge in successive chapters the dominant figures who have shaped the tradition and made the story what it is by their achievements. Because of two destructive fires, the official records for the early period are scant, but the records for the period since the Civil War are abundant. Though manuscript and printed sources form the basis, other records have been used freely. With assiduity, I have sought out the veterans and heard their accounts. Men in active service have given me their frijoles and bread and black coffee. They have suffered me to share their camp, ride their best horses, fire their six-shooters, and to feel the companionship of men and horses when the saddle stirrups touch in the solitudes. They are masters of brevity when they speak of themselves, as economical of words as of pistol smoke. We had a little shooting and he lost, was the way one told the story of a personal encounter. They do not respond to direct questions of a personal nature, and it is best not to ask them. I have been accused once, responded one whose exploits would fill a book. We were camped out on the Pecos. A norther came up. I pulled the cover off and he froze to death. From the official records, I have obtained the official facts. But from the living men, I have, I trust, caught something of the spirit of an institution. WPW, Austin, Texas, September 16, 1935. Now that might seem a bit dry. However, the latter part of what you heard is more the feel of the book. The whole thing is a rather typical history of the Texas Rangers, written by a young historian in the 1930s. More a telling of the exploits in war and law enforcement instead of a scholarly examination of the Texas Rangers and the role it played in early Texas, both good and bad. The author had plans to do some editing of this book before it was re-released in 1965, and I suspect that amongst these changes would have been some editing of some of the more inflammatory sentences. I also suspect that he would have provided more material on the role that the Texas Rangers played during the Civil War post-Reconstruction era, which is basically ignored in the book. However, Mr. Webb was killed in a car crash in 1963, so the original publication remains unchanged. Now, if this appeals to you, head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories and you can have it for free. Here's what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This also gains you access to the free included catalog, which is updated constantly with new titles. So to download your free audiobook, 
Today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. To continue our Western theme, we have a Texas story that has played on the show before. It was originally told by C.F. Eckhart. I found that out through research. There is an author by that name on Amazon, but he passed away in 2015, and he wrote stories about Texas, which fits. I was sent this story by anonymous email, and the sender suggested that he may have written it. Evidence suggests otherwise, which leads me to believe that this tale was likely a rewritten Eckhart one. In the end, I decided to read it anyway, because I really can't know for sure, and it is an excellent tale. I have titled it Stampede Mesa. Texas is a land of many legends. Some of them are just that legends. Some of them have a germ of truth in them, and some of them are entirely true. At one time, when I was a young man, I had the opportunity to hear what some would call a legend from the man who experienced it. Von Schuler had been a cowboy for as long as anyone could remember. He was thought to be born in 1880, but he wasn't so sure about that. However, he was sure that he first went up the trail with the double bar cattle drive in 1892. He said, and I was just a button kid then. He worked as a nighthawk and wrangler, and he was told that he could catch up on his sleep next winter. In 1902, on another double bar drive to Montana, Lon was with the last herd to drive on what's known as Stampede Mesa. Not many people know about Stampede Mesa these days, but from the early 1880s until Texas cattlemen quit driving beef north, Stampede Mesa was, and still may be, one of the most thoroughly haunted places in Texas. Now, go get a map of the state. One of the highway department maps will do. Look where the eastern edge of the panhandle hits the Red River. A little east and south of there, you'll see a lake called Blanco Canyon Reservoir. On the east side of the lake, you'll see a tiny peninsula of land jutting out into the lake. That's Stampede Mesa. It isn't a mesa in the sense of what you'd see in New Mexico or Arizona. It's a somewhat rocky slope with plenty of grass. On the east side is the dried-up McNeil Creek, and most folks tend to call it McNeil Draw. On the west side ran the North Blanco. There was a drop-off there into the draw anywhere from 6 to 20 feet, and another drop-off into the Blanco Canyon of nearly 200 feet at its highest point. Those drop-offs were natural fences. A trail boss could throw his herd into the point, put a light guard across the north end of the point, and rest men, horses, and cattle for a couple of days with plenty of grass and water. It was a very popular place to hold the herd. Now, the story goes that sometime in the early 1880s, a trail boss had some trouble there. A nester, unwanted farmer, had set himself up to the north of the holding point using posts and bob wire. When the big herd came through, the nester's cows wrecked the wire and joined the herd. Of course, that nester demanded that the trail boss cut them out of his herd. The cowboys were tired, and so were the cows. The nester was told that the herd would be cut out after the men had rested. He got insistent, but ended up looking down the wrong end of a six-shooter. 
He was told that the boss would cut the herd, and if he pushed the issue any further, there would be no need to cut the herd, because dead men ain't gonna have no use for cows. The nester left with his drawers in a knot. At midnight, he put on a slicker and mounted his mule. He rode along McNeil Draw until he was about centered on the herd. He then burst out of the brush, flapping the slicker, yelling, and firing his Colt pistol into the air. The result was a stampede. The herd headed west and stampeded straight for the 200-foot drop-off into Blanco Canyon. At least half the herd went over, maybe more. After the cattle were finally milled, the boss began counting cowboys and came up one short. The man who had been on the west side of the herd had gone over with the cattle. He and his cowboy were both dead. How long it took to catch the nester, nobody seems to have recorded, but catch him they did. There was a debate, but the trail boss made the decision. The nester was bound and tied to the saddle on his mule. The mule was then blindfolded and pointed west towards the drop-off. The nester was given half a minute or so to make his peace, and then the boss laid a six-shooter along the mule's rump and fired. The mule bolted straight for the drop-off, carrying the screaming nester with him. The cowboy was buried beneath a big cottonwood at the north end of the point. The nester was left to rot with the cows. That holding point, Stampede Mesa, on the north Blanco, got an evil reputation. Herds that were held there invariably stampeded to the west. If you tried to hold the area, you lost animals and sometimes men. The stampedes were caused by white things that came out of the brush on the east side. Ghosts of cattle and of cowboys? Who can say? Now, our story doesn't end there. Do you remember that I mentioned a cowboy, Lon Schuler? Well, here is a story about Stampede Mesa. Yeah, I reckon I was there, Lon said. Spring of Ot too, it was. Me and a pal of mine, a feller named George Ramp, signed on for a cattle drive going plumb to Montana. Got up on the North Blanco, the boss says, we're going to hold on the point. Let me tell you, about half the crew drew their time right then. Me and George, though, we was full of pus and vinegar and wasn't going to let no spook going to scare us. Them old hands, they told us we was crazy if we stayed, but we'd done it anyway. Me and George, we drew second watch. That's about from ten in the evening till about two in the morning. We decided we'd dry double circle, one of us going one way around, the other going the other. So we'd cross twice during each round, and if we'd seen anything peculiar, we could warn each other. It was right around midnight, and I was on the east side. That's when them things started coming out of the bush. Looked like cows, but no cows I'd ever seen. They was plumb as white as milk. They didn't make no sound at all, and then didn't look like they even walked. They just sort of floated by. Now, I was riding a claybank gelding, one of the steadiest horses I ever had. Never knew that horse to shy from anything afore, but he didn't want nothing to do with them things. Trouble was, we couldn't get away from them. They was everywhere. I hit one with my hand, but it just went in. Felt like hitting cold smokes. That's what it felt like. I hollered real loud, look out, George, they're going to run. And sure enough, they did. George, he was on the west side, and he had taken his lariat, commencing to hit the leaders on the noses, trying to turn them. Don't let nobody ever tell you you can turn a herd by shooting in front of them. All that does is scare them worse and make them run faster. Well, the fellers that weren't out there, I mean with George and I, all they had to do was put their boots on and grab some saddled horses. While we did lose about 200 head, we managed to turn them and mill them and keep the rest from going over the side. Now, that trail boss... 
He comes up to me a hollering, damn it, Lon, he says. It was your hollering that started that run. I ought to pull you off that horse and stomp your head in. Now, George, he wasn't a cussin' sort of fella. He'd say a word now and then, but he wasn't a big cusser. He laid into that trail boss, and I swear he called him everything but a white man. When he got through, he told that feller if Lon hadn't hollered when he did, I'd be down there with them cows. He was up here, you wasn't. That wasn't no low-flying nighthawk or a possum that had loosed the herd. We seen them things. They was ghost cows. Well, so many thanks to both the emailer of the story and, of course, C.F. Eckert. Whichever of you is the author, it is a great tale, and it does belong on Ron's Amazing Stories. Well, that's it for this time. If you have a story that you want to share, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com, click on the story submission banner, leave your story, give it a title, and please tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured story comes from probably the greatest Western series of all time. Not just on the radio, but on the television as well. Of course, we're talking about Gunsmoke. The series was special for many reasons, but probably the biggest is that it was the first adult Western to make the grade. And boy, did it make it. The show appeared on both radio and television from 1952 all the way until 1975. In fact, the radio version lasted until 1960 and was one of the very last shows to be canceled from radio. Only Johnny Dollar continued on through 1961. Our story today comes from the last season of the show. It is titled Born to Hang and it first aired on October 9th, 1960. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal, the first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> Maybe you're sort of tired of eating the same old thing day after day. Maybe you'd like to try something different, something delicious, something with a marvelous flavor that just knocks the spots off any other cereal old you've ever tried. Now, if that's the case, why don't you ask your mother to let you have a big bowl of crackly, crunchy, golden brown Wheaties Flakes tomorrow morning. Ask your mother to let you have a cereal you'll really like the taste of. Ask her for the big, husky cereal for wide-awake fellows and girls who not only star things, but who see them through. You'll say it swell. Try Wheaties, they're whole wheat with all of the brand. Or to try Wheaties, for wheat is the best food of man. They're crispy, they're crunchy the whole year through. Jack Hampton never tires of them, and neither will you. So just buy Wheaties, the best breakfast food in the land. My 
Might as well stand up, Digger. They're just about ready for you. Bring them over here, Glick. Yeah. We'll start walking. We were mighty lucky to find you so near a cottonwood grove. You don't know what we'd have done otherwise. Uh, you'd have thought of something, Glick. Like what? You ain't above shooting a man in the back, are you? You could make me mad talking like that, Digger. And that worries me a lot. Oh, shut up. Hurry up, Glick. Let's get this over with. We've been waiting on you, Pete. Uh, what's Robo looking so long-faced about? What I told you before. This ain't right. You telling me it ain't right to hang a horse thief? It ain't right to hang nobody the way you're doing it. And I don't hold with lynching. Hanging a horse thief ain't lynching. You can't even prove he's a thief. Then what was he doing with our horses? I was camped. I didn't know nothing about your horses. Well, I suppose they wandered up to you in the night, huh? I don't know how they got there. Yeah. <laughs> but we do. That ain't so, Glick. We don't know nothing of the kind. I've lost horses the same as you and Pate. And I don't like it any better than you do, but... Just because this man was camped near a few head of yours is no proof he was stealing them. We're wasting time listening to you, Robo. Yeah. You don't like what we're doing once you just get out. All right. I'm going to get out now. You keep your mouth shut about this, you hear? You wouldn't dare say nothing, Glick. You better not. Looks got an empty dangling there. Why don't you put his neck here? You men are nothing but murderers. There's no way to go to your maker, calling people names. Yeah. Now get on your horse. Go on. What are you going to do? Hold the rope? No, of course not. I'm going to tie it to the trunk of the tree, and we'll slap that horse out from under you. Get mounted now. How can I get mounted with my hands tied? Oh, well, I'll help you. There. All right, Pete, take up the slack, will you? Yeah. And get that rope tied. I'll go get our horses. You might have the decency to wait and put a bullet in me. Bullets well, cost seven cents apiece, Digger. You're worse than I thought. That rope tied enough. You figure it. I guess it'll do. Yeah. All set, Digger? I ain't afraid. Wouldn't matter if you was, would it? You're off, Pete. Let's get him up. Okay. I'll give his horse a lick and then we'll ride off. I ain't got no stomach to... Watch a man hang. You cowards. Go on, Glick. Get it over with. All right, let's go. into them trees. I couldn't fight them. Not the two of them. But I sure didn't aim to let them hang you. I don't know. I don't know how to thank a man for saving me. There's no need to. Robo. Robo, it's the truth. It's honest truth. I ain't a horse thief. I never thought you was, Digger. 
Can you stand? Yeah. Yeah. Look, if we ain't but ten miles from Dodge, I'd be proud to buy you a drink. All right. I I got something mighty interesting to tell you on the way. You know what? We like them. Chester? Hello, Rosal. Ain't Marshal Dillon showed up yet? Well, he went into office for a minute. He said for you to sit down, he'll be right back out. <laughs> Tell him about Joe Digger? Well, I told him about the lynching and how you cut him down. Is that all? Well, I started to tell him the rest, but he was in a hurry. He said he'd hear it all from you. It's bad, ain't it? Yeah, well, you're doing everything you can about it. Mm-hmm. I hate informing on people. Yeah, but murder's worse, really. Oh, well, here he is. Isn't it all over? Hello, Marshal. Sit down. Uh, I've been sitting there. Ain't time for it. Uh, Chester told me about what happened. That was a fine thing you did, Robo. I don't hold with lynching, Marshal. No. And I don't hold with murder either. Huh? Well, what do you mean? He's going to kill him. He says he don't care how he does it. This Joe Digger, you mean? That's what he said, Marshal. And he meant it, too. Well, my land, you sure can't blame him much after what they've done to him. I didn't say if his life so as he could go on a killing spree, Chester. Where is he, Robo? I left him over at the Long Branch. I, I don't want to come point him out to you, but he he's a tall fella. No beard, wearing a black hat. I'll find him. Come on, Chester. Uh, are Glick and Pate in town, Robo? I ain't seen him, and I sure don't want to. No. Now, you better keep out of sight for a while. I aim to, Marshal. Good. I take it you know what happened. Yeah. Then what are you doing here? Why aren't you out after Glick and Pate? One thing at a time, Kitty. Well, if you don't believe it about Joe Beaver now, you will when you see him. He's got a mark around his neck like a blacksmith. It's a horrible thing, that you mentioned man. Yeah, that's about the worst thing I know. What about those two men? I mean, since they really didn't hang him. They came close enough for me, Kitty. Oh, there he is. He just came in. Headed for the bar, you see? Yeah. Uh, no, Chester, you stay here. Uh... All right, sir. You, Joe Digger? Yeah, that's me. 
I hear you ran into some trouble today. Yeah, I seen you talking to Miss Kitty. Well, I came in here looking for you. What for? I'm a marshal. Oh? Uh, somebody tries to lynch a man, I want to know about it. <laughs> it's all over, Marshal. They didn't kill nobody. You mean you'd like for me to forget about it? Well, nothing happened. I'm alive, ain't I? Seems to me you take it pretty easy, Digger. An ordinary man might be kind of mad about it. Ah, they made a mistake, Marshal. They thought they was doing right. Uh, a little rope burn ain't gonna hurt me. Digger. Don't you think you're wasting your time? Lying to me. What? I came here to tell you to leave Black and Pete to me. Which one you going after first, Marshal? Why, so you can get the other one? They don't deserve a trial. They're going to get one. And so will you if you kill either one of them. I've been pretty lucky so far. Look, Digger, I know how you feel about this, but stay out of it. From now on, this is my business. Now, you're denying me what's mine. That kind of thinking is going to lead you to the end of another rope. That's not worth it. And to me, maybe it is. Don't be a fool. Think about it. Okay. I'll think about it. It's midnight now, and I'll think about it till tomorrow midnight. And by then, you better have him in jail, Marshal. Sure. Them are you. I bet them glicks ain't even home, Mr. Jones. Yeah, there's smoke coming out of the chimney, Chester. Mm, dinner? Not very likely Miss Glick's going to be feeding the law today. Mm, no, I reckon not. All right, let's leave them here. Hey, that horse you've got a loose shoe, ain't it, Mr. Jones? I'll have to fix it before we start back. Provide him to the lenses, too. He won't have much choice about it. Yeah. Think you'll put up a fight? I don't know. He might. Inside. Well, sure. Come on in. Uh, uh, the woman's done with dinner, but I'll uh, I'll tell her to find something for you. No, don't bother. I I want to talk to you. Oh, what about you and Hank Pate? Me and Pate. Uh huh. We'll go pick him up when we leave here. Taking you both to jail. Now, wait a minute, Marshal. Do I have to explain it to you? Well, it might help. You walk into a man's house and arrest him, he ought to know what it's about. Didn't you and Pate murder a man yesterday? What man? Joe Digger. Digger. I never heard of no Joe Digger. And you shouldn't go around lynching strangers. Oh, oh, well, that's what this is all about. <laughs> oh, yeah, I seen that fellow, Marshal. Yeah, I, I was riding right by there yesterday. I seen him hanging. But I, I don't know who did it. Sure wasn't me and Pate. Digger says it was. What? He says you and Pate lynched him. Robo, Robo told you. Robo cut him down. Digger's alive. Well, 
Well, then what are you at Gross for? Attempted murder. You're going to get at least 20 years, Glick. But it'll save your life. What do you mean? Digger's after you. He's going to kill you if he gets a chance, but I beat him here. Now I want to get to Pates before he does. Pates? Uh, Pates, he's in Dodge today. Then we better get moving. You're a prisoner, Glick. Oh, no, wait a minute, Marshal. Keep an eye on him, Chester. I'm going to take my horse around to the barn and fix that shoe, and then we'll leave. Huh? Okay, sir. She slipped him a gun. He snapped off a shot at me and ran out back so I could move. She stood in the doorway so I couldn't shoot. How's your arm? Is it broken? No, no, it's just tore up a little. I better stop him before he gets on a horse. And she stood out there in the kitchen and heard every word that was said. I never thought about her aiming to help. The barn door is open. We going to walk right up there? No, no, we can't do that. Here, we'll wait here by the corner of the house. You get out behind that rain barrel. Might as well, I sure ain't much use. Yeah, he's seen it. Don't you try to stop me now, Marshal. It's no use to run. Hold it, Glenn. You got him? Yeah. He rode straight for you. Why, why didn't he go the other way? He knew our horses were out in front. He wanted to get to them before we did. Well, there's one man that won't go to jail. Oh, my. Here comes his wife. He's dead, ma'am. No. This is Dennis James. Say, remember way back when this melody was popular? There's something very special about a long-time favorite, isn't there? Well, folks feel the same way about one of Kellogg's favorites, Kellogg's All Bran. Going on 41 years now, it's been America's most popular good food way to fight irregularity from lack of bulk. Because it's whole bran, Kellogg's All Bran gentles away irregularity safely and reliably. And because it's deep toasted for extra crispness, it never gets mushy in milk. There's only one All Bran, Kellogg's All Bran. That's A double L hyphen B R A N. Kellogg's All Brand. Come 
Come in. Uh, hello, Doc. Oh, oh I'm all finished. About uh, a couple of weeks. I can start you in my arm again, Mr. Jones. Good. Yeah, and there's providing you keep it in that sling, Chester. Oh, I will, Doc. I'll be real careful. Is it all right, Doc? Yes, it looks clean, Matt, but I'll I'll change the dressing of the day for a while so as I can watch it. Did you get the horses put up, Mr. Jones? Yeah, I took care of them. Then we better start looking for Hank Page. Near midnight, Chester. You go to bed and I'll find him. No, sir, I'm going with you. Oh, I know I ain't much help, but I can look one way while you're looking the other. Well, that's up to you. Up to him? You know, I've heard of cases where this sort of thing was up to the doctor, not the patient. I ain't no patient, Doc. Oh, no. Maybe you'll begin to feel more like a patient when I give you my bill. Bill? You're going to charge me for pouring that smelly old stuff on my arm and wrapping it up with a couple of little rags? Uh, Chester, your bill has just gone up a dollar. You were not, Doc. I didn't really mean that. <laughs> you better shut up and come with me, Chester. You'll be a lot safer. Yes, ma'am. I sure am. See you later, Doc. Yes, well, the matter is, is there going to be a shooting? I don't know. But you better not go to bed for a while yet. Oh, I'll be here. Mister? Yes, Hasn't your arm even hurt? Well, sure it does. It hurts fierce. But that helps keep me away. I don't think it hurts at all. You'd be yelling your head off. It does too hurt. You just don't realize how brave I am. I'm trying to get you to go to bed, Chester. I know you are. Where we look first? All right, Texas Trail's the closest. I guess anything that already happened, Doc could have heard of it, wouldn't you? Yeah. Say, maybe if we run into Joe Digger first, you ought to lock him up temporarily, like. I aim to. Of course, Pete might have left town already and gone home. And they told me his horse is still at the stable, Chester. I guess he's not planning to go home tonight. He'll be disappointed if he is. That was in Texas Trail, Mr. Jones. Yeah. He just come out. You stay here. Yes, sir. Digger. Uh, you're too late, Marshal. Did you do that shooting? Well, I waited. I told you I would. You waited for what? Well, to kill Hank Pink. What? It's after midnight. Five minutes or so. I just figured you wasn't going to do nothing about it. Now you figured wrong. Were both those shots yours? Sure they were. I didn't even wait for him to draw. You know, a man like that don't deserve a chance. You should have let the law decide about that, Digger. I'd have arrested him. He'd have gone to jail. All right, then why hadn't you done it? Because I was busy. Busy doing what? Trying to take Glick. Trying? Where is he? He's dead. And I guess I beat you to him. Now, you didn't beat me to Hank Pate, Marshal. For your sake, I wish I had. All right, Digger, you're under arrest for murder. Oh, no, no. Now, that ain't fair. I warned you. No. Mr. Jones, you all right? What's the matter? Did he try to draw on you? I couldn't see him. He tried, Chester. Maybe I should have let him. But then you'd have had to shoot him. I know. This way, like I told him, I, I probably just saved him for the end of another rope. Snap, what a happy 
sound. Snap is the happiest sound I've found. You may clap, rap, tap, slap, but snap makes the world go round. Snap, crackle, pop, rice krispies. I say it's crackle, the crispy sound. You gotta have crackle or the clock's not wound. Peace, cackle, feathers, tickle, belts, buckle, beats, pickle, but crackle makes the world go round. Snap, crackle, pop, rice krispies. I insist that pops the sound. The best is missed unless pops around. You can't stop hopping when the cereal's popping. Pop makes the world go round. Snap, crackle, pop, Rice Krispies. Let's go for Kellogg's Rice Krispies. Snap, it's crackle. What a happy sound. You gotta have the crackle or the clown not bound. You be can't stop a hop and the cereal swapping. Snap, crackle. Pop makes the world go round. Gun smoke. Produced and directed in Hollywood by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. The story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston. Featured in the cast were John Porkham and Jess Kirkpatrick. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. The quality on that one wasn't the best, but the story was pretty good. That particular episode aired twice during the Gunsmoke run. The first time was during Season 3 in April of 1955. It starred Joseph Kearns. I would have played it, but the quality was so bad on that one that there was no way I could clean it up to make it usable. Gunsmoke is hit and miss on the quality of the surviving episodes. However, if the episode played on the Armed Forces Radio, you were guaranteed a near-perfect recording. This was because they would record the show on these huge transcription discs and then ship them overseas for our men and women serving there. It's amazing how popular Gunsmoke was with our guys. Maybe you're sort of tired of eating the same old thing day after day. Maybe you'd like to try something different. Something delicious. Something with a marvelous flavor that just knocks the spots off any other cereal you've ever tried. Now, if that's the case, why don't you ask your mother to let you have a big bowl of crackly, crunchy, golden brown Wheaties Flakes tomorrow morning. Ask your mother to let you have a cereal you'll really like the taste of. Ask her for the big, husky cereal for wide-awake fellows and girls who not only star things, but who see them through. You'll say it swell. Fried Wheaties, they're whole wheat with all of the bran. Won't you try Wheaties, for wheat is the best food of man. They're crispy, they're crunchy the whole year through. Jack Hampton never tires of them and neither will you. So just buy Wheaties, the best breakfast food in the land. That was episode number 556, and I hope that you enjoyed the stories. After all, why else come to a podcast called Ron's Amazing Stories? Thank you for joining me today. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button makes us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.